Hello, hello, hello. Yes, praise the Lord. It is Lady B. And it is Sunday school time. Have you been studying your lesson? Have you been studying the word of God? This is not the time to be slack. We need the word of God. If you're not sure whether you need the word of God or not, read. Oh, they don't have newspapers. Oh, dating myself. There are no more newspapers. All you got to do is read the newspaper or if you can find one or Google it or some type of news and you will see that we need the word of God. That's what's going to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Okay, so I pray that you are making plans to go to Sunday school or to Bible study. Now, I always say this. We have an awesome lesson on today. Ananias heals Saul. So let's first of all say we know that Ananias didn't heal anybody. Jesus healed him. And I just want to say that because I know people think I'll be doing the most. But, you know, we we so many people are taking credit for what God does and who he is. We can't heal. We can't save. We can't deliver. You know, it's not your anointing. It's not my anointing. The righteousness that we have is the righteousness of God. Amen. So we want to give God all the glory and all the honor and all of the praise. It's all due him. Awesome lesson on today for all of us. I must include myself who when we look over our lives and we realize that we do not deserve to be used of God. Our lives have been that it is only by his grace and mercy that we are used. And a lot of times the enemy likes to make us feel guilty and he likes to bring condemnation. And so then we um, never fulfill our purpose in the earth because of what we did. You know, isn't, isn't the blood of Jesus so amazing? So in our lesson today, we're going to find how God heals a man that was killing Christians. Heals a man that I keep saying killing. I don't think I've seen that in scripture, but I know he was putting him in jail. Now I'm not saying he didn't kill anybody because he sure was there when Stephen got stoned, but we know he was going about putting Christians in jail jail. I want to talk about that a little bit just to give us a little insight on Paul. And then we're going to get into our lesson, which I kind of think is, is a part of the lesson. So we can kind of understand this man that Ananias is being sent to. So let's pray. And then we're going to get into the lesson. Lord, we love you. We bless you. We thank you. There is none like you in all of the earth. Oh God, be with us in this lesson on today. Give me what to say. And give those that you have led to hear, to view, to listen the lesson. Lord Jesus, give them the ears to hear, the hearts to receive what you have for them. In your matchless name, Jesus, we pray. Okay, so let's get to my slides. We're going to talk about Paul on a little bit. Paul was a Pharisee. And this was one of the religious sects that actually started, um, you know, there's a period that's called the intertestamental period between the time of the last writings of the Old Testament and when Jesus was born. And there was a lot of stuff that was going on during that time. And it's called the intertestamental period. And during the intertestamental period, the, the uh, religious sect, the Jewish religious sect of the Pharisees was formed because they wanted to make sure that people were keeping the laws. So they accepted the written word as God had inspired it. Now, when they say the written word, we're not talking about the Bible. We are talking about the Old Testament, what we consider the Old Testament. So it's the law, the first five books, the writings, which are like the poetry and so forth, and then the prophets. So those were the writings for the Jews, and they accepted that. Um, and as this says, you know, it would have been called the Old Testament. They also gave equal authority to the oral traditions that had been passed down. So these Pharisees were actually, had actually 
added to particularly the laws of Moses. So then evolving over centuries, these traditions added to God's word and the Pharisees sought to strictly obey these traditions along with the Old Testament. And so this is one of the reasons why they had a problem with Jesus because he was violating their laws. And so one of the errors or some of the errors of the Pharisees, and this is important because uh, Paul, Saul at this point, uh, was a Pharisee. So they were very much lifted up in pride. They were, they were very prideful people. They prided themselves in um, keeping all of the law. Now we already know the Bible says nobody's righteous, but in their minds, they had all of these laws and they had all of these written things. Remember like when they told Jesus, why don't your, your disciples wash their hands and, and so forth and so on. And, you know, Jesus talked to them about that. And so, um, they didn't like for the fact that Jesus came and he was a rival. Can I say that? I know they were saying the um, position to be questioned, but you know, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the people. Unlike the Sadducees, who were the aristocrats, they were the rich people. You know, they were about wealth and they were for whoever the authority figures were over the Jews. And so the Sadducees were not the same, but the Pharisees were for the common people. And so Jesus came and he came feeding the common people and he came healing the common people and the common people were flocking to Jesus and that became a problem. So this is what, when we look at Paul and what Paul, and I, just forgive me, I know the scripture, the lesson says Saul, but he was Paul. You know, Paul being a, a devout Pharisee, he was devout. He was committed. So in his mind, Jesus was the enemy and everybody that followed Jesus was the enemy. Paul did not see him as being evil. He felt that the, the Christians were the evil ones. They were the ones that were going against the law and following this man who was not right, this man that was claiming to be Messiah, that man that was claiming to be God. And that was a violation because, you know, Paul said in Philippians that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. That means he followed it to the T. And so I just wanted to share that so we would understand that when, 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 um, God called Paul in Paul's wisdom. You know, he had a zeal, but it wasn't according to knowledge. Paul said that about the Jews. And we can also say that about him. He had a zeal, but it was not according to knowledge. So I think that's that's significant. And so we find that Paul in his um in his zeal, his 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 ignorant zeal. He's in Jerusalem and he goes to the high priest in Jerusalem and he asks for papers to be able to go into the synagogue in Damascus and be able to arrest whoever he found that was following this Jesus that in his mind was the false God. It, he was not the true Messiah because they were looking for somebody to come politically, for someone to come and rescue them politically. They were not thinking about their sin, sick souls. So they had fully missed even what the prophets had said. And then we know that Paul um, had that experience where he was blinded by the light. And, you know, I like this picture because, um, you know, I always would say Paul was knocked off the horse. Well, you know, this is why we got to make sure we're studying the scripture. The Bible doesn't say anything about Paul being on a horse, but we do know he fell to the ground and we do know he saw a bright light and we do know that he was blinded. And we do know the Lord was basically saying to Paul, why are you fighting against me, Paul? So this experience must have been so great because it caused Paul from that point on, it caused Paul to, to follow it in the way. And so our, our lesson picks up now, if you look at verse 10, it says, 
actually, let's, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let, let's go through this. Our golden text is, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. So now this is significant. Remember, this is the man that was going around killing the Jews. And so he goes to Ananias and says, I've chosen him. He's going to bear my name. And so the facts of this lesson is we want to detail the call and mission of Ananias. The call, and we say a call, this specific call, because you know you can have more than one call. You call on Tuesday to do one thing. You call on Wednesday to do something else. The call and mission of Ananias. And then the principle is to show that sometimes God calls us to something general, and sometimes he calls us to something specific. And Ananias had a specific call to go heal uh, Saul. And then Saul had a specific call to the Gentiles. God was going to show him what he was called to do, the things that he was going to have to suffer for his namesake. And then our application is, please don't put God in a box. That's my paraphrase of this, to warn that we must not define God's call so narrowly that it limits our awareness of and response to one. Yes, God will call you. I saw a young lady, it was a TikTok, and she was preaching in, in, in at the airport, you know, and the terminal. And, you know, people would say, oh, God wouldn't call you to do that just to stand up in front of all those people. But you know what? That's what the other apostles were doing. That's what the, the prophets did. And so it's not for us to say what God would or would not do. If the person is not violating scripture, if they're not violating scripture, not I'm not talking about violating our, our whatever we got, but if the person is not violating scripture, then we need to pray for them. And if God calls us to them, we need to go. Like with, with, with uh, Saul and Ananias, but, but God, Ananias, I've, I've called him. He bears my name now. And so then Ananias, he had to go. So let's not miss opportunities to share the gospel with those because they don't fit our criteria. Let's make sure that we are not doing that. So when we look at our scripture on today, um, there was a certain disciple at Damascus. Remember, Paul was on his way to Damascus. Obviously, God had changed Paul's plans and he called Ananias and Ananias knew the voice of God. And he said, yes, Lord. And then he said, I want you to get up, go to the street, which is called straight. And I want you to go to Judas's house, verse two, for Saul of Tarsus is there. Pay attention. It says, for behold, that means Ananias, pay attention. Saul is there praying. Well, Jews prayed. They prayed in the temple. So his praying didn't mean anything. But verse 12, he tells Ananias, for he saw a vision. I mean, for he had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So Paul was there praying. I'm sure Bible doesn't tell us. So this is conjecture. I'm sure Paul was praying. What is going on, Lord? What has happened to me? What am I going to do now? Because the very person, the very people I have been taken down, I'm now, I've now become one of them. I'm sure there was a lot of stuff going on in Paul's mind. And then Ananias answered. He said, now, Lord, wait a minute. I've heard about this man, Saul, how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem. Remember, Paul had been in Jerusalem. So he said, no, nah, now the word has gotten up here to Damascus. And uh, we, we, we've heard what, what Paul has done, his threatenings and put people in jail and how even here he have the authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. So he knew that Paul was in Damascus to arrest Christians. He knew that. But the Lord said, have you ever challenged God? Ah, God, I can't do that. God, I can't go over there. God, I can't say that. God, what if they don't receive me? God, and you know, you know, we've all been guilty of that. But the Lord says to him, Ananias, 
This is not, I'm not open. This is not open for discussion. I want you to go. And this is why he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. God said, Ananias, I need you to know there's been a great change that has occurred in Saul. So verse 17, so Ananias gets up. He goes into the house. Whose house was it? It was Judas's house. He puts his hand on, on Paul he, and he calls him brother. That says that Ananias believed what God had said to him. He believed that God had converted him because he called him brother. He he said, he basically was saying to him, we are serving the same God. We're part of the same community. The Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with, with the Holy Ghost. Now, I want you to look at this text where it says, the Lord that appeared unto thee in the way. So in the way would have been in Damascus. But then when we look at verses um, um, 15, but the Lord said unto him, he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings. Sometime between Ananias getting there and going to see Saul and getting to Judas's house, he must have had more conversation with God or somebody reported what had happened about fall, uh, Paul falling down to the ground and being blind. I point that out because I just don't think there's anything wrong with going back to be for sure. Just like with Gideon, you know, sometimes it, it, it might be something scary. It might be um, God might be calling you something that in your natural mind, you know, might be perilous. So he knew that Paul had had an experience on the road. And he says, the Lord has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. When you are called of God, you need, you know, when I was coming up, they said the Holy Ghost, there was no tea, but he was filled with the Holy Ghost. He was empowered for all of this stuff. Verse 16, he's going to be suffering. Paul was told up front that he was going to have to suffer. And I believe because he was told this up front that God was giving him some supernatural strength. Look at verse 15. He was going to go to kings and to the children of Israel, and he was going to bear his name before the Gentiles for all this paganism. And, you know, we call it paganism, but he was dealing with a lot of demonic stuff. So he was going to need the power of the Holy Ghost, the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, the words that the Holy Ghost would give, the, the insight into being able to bridge the Old and the New Testament. He was going to need the Holy Spirit for that. Verse 18, and immediately there fell from his eyes, meaning Saul, as it had been scales. Now, some don't believe they were natural scales, but there was something that was keeping Paul from seeing. And Saul received his sight and arose and was baptized. I've met a lot of people, but I don't think I want to get baptized. I don't get that. If you've been genuinely saved, you want to be baptized. Now, you know, we baptism, no. Baptism is a symbol. If we go to the scripture, when we look at Romans, when we look at Romans, in the Bible, there's a Romans. It says here, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So this baptism is, when we get baptized, that's a symbol of being buried and then being resurrected with Christ. And if you don't have a desire to be baptized, you might want to find out whether or not you actually got trans 
transform. I, I just think a whole lot of people didn't get saved yet because the Holy Ghost is going to tell you, get baptized. You want to be baptized. You want the world to know that I am part of Jesus Christ. I am in the kingdom. And so Paul was baptized saying, and you know, baptism was public saying, yes, now I'm one of them. I know I used to fight against them, but now I am one of them. I won't put my picture back up here. I'm praying that more people have this kind of blinding light can never go back experience. You know, we keep talking about people backsliding. I just think a whole lot of people just never got saved. I'm not even trying to argue uh, once saved, always saved, eternal security, those type of things. I am fully convinced some people just never got saved. It, it, listen, you don't just go in and out of God like that. You don't just one minute. You know, Paul, even when he was told about all the things that he was going to suffer, the Bible says, look at verse 20. When he received this strength, um, he was certain days with the disciples um, that were in Damascus, and then he was preaching in the synagogues. I think about even, you got people, they've been saved 30 years. Well, they say they've been saved 30 years. I don't know what God's will is for my life. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm just waiting on God. You waiting for 30 years? You want me to believe that you genuinely have been asking God what he wants you to do for 30 years? I don't think so. So when he had received meat, because he had been fasting for three days, remember, he was strengthened. Then was Saul with the disciples. And, you know, Ananias had to vouch for him because they were afraid of him. And rightly so. I don't think there's anything wrong with being wary of people because of their past. Now, I'm not telling you to mistreat them. But sometimes you have to have some conversations. Well, you know, sister, let's talk, you know, because we know you were involved in da 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 da. Where are you now? You know, and you know, I, we want to we want to love you and we receive you, but we're watching your walk. We watch the person's walk. Okay. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Listen, when the Holy Ghost comes in, you are going to declare the name of Jesus. He's going to be in your heart, in your mind, in your mouth. You're going to declare his name. So we got a discussion question here. How do we move beyond our reservations about those who have bad reputations? And how do we know that it's, it's, it's safe to embrace them even when they, we know they have hurt others? First of all, I believe just like how God went to Ananias and say, Ananias, he has been changed. We seek the Lord. Don't fall into, we got to make sure we love everybody, everybody feel love. Don't be a kumbaya, or that's what I call them. Don't be a kumbaya, everybody come together. No, you need to use some wisdom. And as I just said, there is nothing wrong with sitting down with a person. That's not judging them. You sit down, and there are some people you need to use some wisdom. And, and say, like, for instance, if the person has trouble with, with minors, you don't have them in the children's ministry. That, that's just what it is. That's, 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 just, that's just what it is. There's certain things people don't even need to be in, but we don't want to hurt you, but we need to know where are you now? Where is your heart? There is that, you know, God, our wisdom doesn't go out the window because somebody got saved. Paul spent time. You look at verse 19. He was certain days with the disciples that gave them a chance to not only pour into him, but to watch him, to see his commitment. There's nothing wrong with that people of God. Yes, I love you, but you know, your anger caused you to kill somebody. We need to know what have you done to be set free from this anger? What have you done to change? That's so important because, you know, salvation. Yes, we're saved from the bondage of sin. Yes, that, you know, positionally, we are righteous. We are right. But that that being transformed, that's a process. That daily becoming like Christ, that's a process. And sometimes even us, we slip and fail and done things. So if a person has a, has a reputation of, of hurting others, there is nothing wrong with having a conversation with them. 
There, there is nothing wrong with, with getting with them and, and, and finding out where they are and letting them know where you are. And if the person's heart has really changed, they will also know that there is going to be a trial process and they're okay with that. You know, when people's hearts are right, they don't get so easily offended when you say, well, you know, it's going to give me, give me some time to trust you. Give me some time, you know, to feel comfortable around you. If they don't say, okay, then it's not time. Because when your heart's really changed, you're also willing to take responsibility for your actions. Okay. One more question. This is in our Sunday school book. Why is it so important to be filled with the Holy Spirit before we go out and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know what? Now we know what the Bible says now, right? Let's go to the scripture. Let's go to the word of God. What y'all got? Why is it so important to be filled with the Holy Spirit before we go out and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why is it important? Everybody got, you know, I love teaching my class. If, let's go to the book of Acts chapter one. He says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus told them, wait for the Holy Ghost before you go out witnessing. And you know, it's the same thing for us. Before we go out there and start encountering all these spirits and all these personalities and all of these things, we don't know what to say. We need the word of God. We need the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts and giving us what to say and giving us what to do. We need the spirit of God. We need the Holy Spirit to get a hold of our tongue. You know, when people may be laughing at you or 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 or, or cussing you out or any number of things, we need the Holy Spirit of God. Or we'd be like the sons of Sceva when the demon said, Paula, no, Jesus, I know, but y'all right here that's playing games, we don't know you. And they ran those men out of that place naked because they were trying to do what Paul did. So when we go out there and we encounter the world, remember uh, Paul said in Ephesians chapter six, that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness and high places. And so we need the power of God to even give us the discernment that we need. So that's why. So that's all I have for this lesson. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. If you have a past, we all have a past. And if the enemy has been telling you that you cannot be used of God, tell the enemy that he is a liar. God can use whoever he wants. He can call whoever he wants. And if God is calling you to someone and maybe you feel a little uncomfortable going to minister to them, to talk to them or whatever, you know, go have another talk with God. Just like, just like Ananias did somewhere in here. That is not recorded in scripture. Ananias was talking to God. I don't think it was just a one. Ananias, go. I need to go. Go tell him the things that that um that he's going to suffer. Um, you know, he had a vision about a man. I think Ananias was praying as he went. So let's pray as we go, but let's make sure we go because God is going to be sending us to people. They don't know the way. They 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 know that they God is calling them. God's been wooing them. They've been having dreams. They've been having visions, and they need somebody to help them put those pieces together. So let's be like Ananias, willing and ready to go. I think it's so beautiful how God can call Ananias, and Ananias answered. So if God is calling you, 
I'm asking you to answer. You may feel inadequate, but that's what the Holy Ghost is for. You don't have to have all the ability. I don't have to have all of the ability. You know, my brother keeps trying to show me how to use all this stuff. I'm getting a little better. But in the meantime, I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep sharing and I'm going to keep teaching. And I want to encourage you to keep doing what God has called you to do what you know God is calling you to do. Because you know what? If you'll go, he'll, he'll send the Holy Ghost before you. He'll be on top of you, on behind you, on the side of you, on the side of you. He will lift you up and take you to where God is calling you to be. And you will be able to do it with power, with his anointing. Because there's a Saul out there that needs his eyes healed. There's a soul out there that needs you to pray for them, you to minister to them. And I'm praying that you would be the Ananias to a soul that God has called for such a time as this. Thank you so much uh, for for joining with me on today. Thank you for liking and subscribing. Thank you for all your comments and your encouragements. Thank you for following me. Help me to spread the word. Help, you know, and I pray I've said something to help you when you teach your lesson or just in your daily devotionals or whatever. Please pray for me as I pray for you. Be blessed in Jesus' name.